listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to www.nakedbiblemod.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 39, Acts 2, verse 42 through 47. I'm your residential layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how are you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing again? I'm doing good. So we're going to wrap up Acts 2 today. Yep. Yep. We will indeed. Okay. Looking forward to it. All right. So we will, again, get through the rest of the book of Acts today. And then I think, as we'll, we'll find out at the end, I think we're planning on a uh, an episode of Q&A. So we'll say something about that at the end. But for today, let's just jump into the last several verses of Acts chapter 2. This, believe it or not, this little section is surprisingly controversial. And if it's not immediately familiar to you, uh, I think by the time I read through it here in the next few minutes, you'll see why it's controversial or it might you know, sort of tip something off in your memory as far as what could be done with these you know, five or six verses of Scripture. So beginning in verse 42, we read, they, again, the, uh, the, the fledgling church there in, in Jerusalem, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now this passage, as you can probably tell, if you paid close attention to it, has been used by many people, scholars or otherwise, to defend socialism or communism or some sort of politically utopian society, as though one of those political economic systems is the biblical, quote-unquote, biblical form of government, or that it has some sort of theological superiority over any other system. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that isn't the case at all. Now, as we jump in for the sake of definition, uh, here's how I would define uh, terms like socialism and communism, again, for the sake of our discussion. Socialism is an economic system, and it's one that advocates public ownership of all resources so that the production and distribution of resources or wealth within a society uh, then is under the control of the members of that society, either collectively or by some sort of governmental body that, quote-unquote, represents the society. Uh, In a socialist system, socialist economy, workers contribute to the society based on their ability, uh, what they can produce, rather than being paid wages and using money to purchase what they want. They don't have to purchase anything they want because everything, everybody has all things in common, so to speak. Private possessions are limited to personal use items. And, of course, the goal is distribution of cumulative wealth and, in theory, equality among everyone. Now, communism is sort of you know, upping the ante with socialism. Communism is socialism with teeth, as some people have said. Uh, it abolishes private ownership and seeks to create a classless society, uh, hence the term communism. Again, the abolition of private property is a major feature of communism. And really, in theory and practice, both of these ideas, again, forbidding private property and having a society without classes is sort of nonsense because you need leadership. You need people at the top to enforce those rules or those ideas uh, because not everybody's just going to want to do that. And so you need some sort of coercion and enforcement. And that in and of itself creates two different classes. So as soon as people who mutually agree, again, in theory, to have a classless society do or say something perceived as violating the idea, you know, those people have to be dealt with or they, in fact, become sort of a default superior ruling class. So socialism and communism, there's a lot of overlap there. One is sort of more militant or coercive than the other. 
Now, the question is, for our purposes, does Acts 2, 42 through 47, teach either of these systems? So again, reading part of the passage again, verse 44, all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Okay, And then day by day, they were doing things like gathering together in the temple and attending the temple, breaking bread in their houses, so on and so forth. Now, on the surface, it sounds like what's described here could fit with socialism or communism, but that conclusion misses a number of pretty obvious things. So first, if you notice in the passage, there's no state authority in the passage. It's talking about the apostles, and of course, that would be the 12, and really the greater number, the 120 we saw from Acts chapter 1, and probably some converts from the day of Pentecost. And I say probably because most of the people actually mentioned at Pentecost were from other countries. That was the whole idea. The whole point was that once they had embraced the gospel, they'd return to the nations and begin the process of reclaiming the nations that were disinherited in the Babel event. So in this passage, there's no state authority. It's not setting up a state system of government, government for the whole society. It's very particular. Second, what we read is described as voluntary. Since there's no state authority, that makes sense. In fact, we don't even read that the apostles taught anyone they should do this, you know, sell their goods and all that sort of thing. Uh, they don't actually you know, teach them to do this. Like, you know, now that you're Christians, you're supposed to do this, or this is the right thing to do, or we're setting up the kingdom of God, and this is it, we're going to sell all our private property. There's none of that going on in the passage. In fact, since it's entirely voluntary, it's from the heart. And that alone, the absence of coercion and a mandate by sort of overlords distinguishes what's going on in Acts 2, 40 through, 42 through 47 from socialism and communism and really any other sort of political state. The people were selling possessions and distributing the wealth to the poor voluntarily. We're also going to see this again in Acts chapter 4 and 5. And, of course, Peter in those contexts says very plainly that it wasn't required. Uh, Acts 4 and 5, there's no condemnation of private property either. It's just that this is what some people were doing. They didn't have to do it. They did it voluntarily. They thought it was the right thing to do to help people out. And so they did it. And it gets recorded and mentioned in the book of Acts in several places. Now, that's the immediate context. If we move to a wider context and make some observations, we see as well where this use, and I would say this abuse, of Acts chapter 2 sort of becomes apparent. A couple other thoughts. The activity described in Acts of having all things in common, that phrase is actually only mentioned in Acts 2 and 4 uh, in the New Testament. The phrase never occurs of any other New Testament church founded by Paul or any other apostle. Now, that suggests that there was something unique about the situation in the original Jerusalem church that presumably wasn't transmitted or handed down by the apostles as some sort of binding custom or inspired idea to other New Testament churches. That omission would be really strange if what we're reading in Acts chapter 2 was binding revelation or a binding example you know, this is what the kingdom of God is. If that was true, the omission here is strange since it's not passed down to all the other churches that we read about in the New Testament, much less some sort of political state. Second, according to the rest of the New Testament, the shared wealth of the Jerusalem church did not elevate its economic condition. Now, this is one of the myths that socialism and communism spread, that if, you know, this whole idea of everybody having all things in common, each according to his own need, the leveling or the commonality is always in the downward direction. It's never the the, the people you know who are poor being elevated to having wealth uh, like the people at the top. It's always the people at the top sort of essentially have their – their wealth taken from them and distributed so that everyone is at, at some sort of level of uh, underclass compared to you know the the wealth that had existed again prior to the to the advent of this sort of system so you know that alone 
you know, should should make a suspect, you know, of, of what's going on. But if you actually look at the Jerusalem church, it's sort of illustrative of this myth. Again, if if, if this was this this utopian society, well, then you'd think that the Jerusalem church would have been so much better off than other churches. They would have been sort of the model. But the exact opposite is what you read in the New Testament. The church of Jerusalem is is described in the New Testament every time that you know you get into these sorts of details as notoriously poor. And its poverty was the reason that Paul took up collecting money on his missionary trips from the startup Gentile churches. The, the joy of the Jerusalem church wasn't in the fact that they were all the same at a very low economic level, like this is a great thing. What, what, made, what made it you know, noteworthy in Acts 2 was they had each other and they were all in Christ, and they, they, were, they were mutually supportive. They didn't have much, but what they did have, you know, they, they took care of each other. Again, it was not sort of to create a model economic system that's utopian in nature that everybody should, should just thirst after. Uh, that is clearly not what we see in the New Testament. The goal was unity and community. It wasn't to make some sort of economic or political statement. Uh, if, if it made any statement at all, it would be this doesn't work. As far as again having a you know much more than a subsistence lifestyle. Now, if we move from there to an even wider context, we come to what I think is the most significant context of all, and one that disconnects the church from any, and I mean any, including the American the, the American system that that many of us really enjoy and love. Uh, the church is disconnected from all political systems. And that's because of what some things Jesus said. Jesus could not have been much clearer when he said, prior to the events of Acts chapter 2, this is way back in the Gospels. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. That's John eighteen thirty six. The kingdom of God is not to be identified with any political or socioeconomic system that guides statecraft. The concerns of God's kingdom are other than those of an earthly state. So consequently, Acts 2, 42 through 47 cannot legitimately be used to tell the state how to conduct its business. That isn't the concern of the kingdom of God. The political systems of men are to be evaluated by biblical theology's opposition to things like coercive power and the sanctity and dignity of human life. Again, that's biblical theology and, of course, divine law. But nowhere does Scripture teach that the, ch- that the church is the state or more obviously, that the state is the church. Again, Jesus himself, in another place, called for the separation of the church and the state. He spoke of the kingdom of heaven as distinct from the state. You know, the the whole render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And again, back to John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. And so to marry any political system, even if it's one we like, to the church— is to transgress biblical theology, very clear biblical theology, I might add, as well. We don't marry the kingdom of God to any kingdom of man, you know, period. I I just don't know what Jesus could have said to be any clearer on this point. Now, finally, the, the Bible, especially the Old Testament, makes some other things clear that are at odds with specific aspects of socialism and, and communism, and we're targeting those because that's typically how Acts 2, 42 through 47 is, is cast. And I want to list out some of those, again, some of these other things that are pretty clear in Scripture. Number one, the Bible doesn't forbid or condemn private property. Okay, it, it, it you know, quite transparently does the reverse. Laws against thievery okay, are what they are and only make sense as they are, if private property is something that is good, that is valued, that is legitimate. The Bible doesn't forbid or condemn private property. Second, the Bible doesn't forbid or condemn private possessions that are used to you know, create wealth, entrepreneurship, having a business, that sort of thing. Uh, profit is actually neither forbidden nor condemned. Now, what is condemned are things like extortion. You know, using uh, your economic power to, again, coerce someone to do something uh, for you, uh, again, or against their, you know, 
against their status. I mean, that sort of thing is is universally condemned in Scripture. Uh, using your wealth, again, to create injustice before the law, absolutely condemned in Scripture. But the idea of, again, owning private property and having a business and generating wealth, you know, employing people, these things are not condemned in Scripture. Third, the Bible contains no laws that call for a classless society. In fact, Old Testament law presumes social classes. And, you know, it's just sort of part and parcel of, of hum, human behavior and, frankly, human ability. I mean, we're all created in, the, in God's image, but we're not all created equal in terms of our attributes, our, our abilities, our interests, our ambitions, our drives, and those sorts of things. Those things get manifest in different ways because we're, we're all, you know, we're different. Uh, you know, we share a status and an identity being a divine imager, back to Genesis one twenty six, and so on. And that's the way God made us. We reflect him. Again, we, we share that attribute and other attributes with him. But that doesn't mean we're all clones. We all have the same interests and abilities. Uh, the same thing can be said for the teachings of Jesus. Not only does the Old Testament law presume social classes, but when Jesus talked about social classes, and he brings them up a lot, he never calls for their abolition. What he calls for is righteousness among the members of social classes within their class and to all the other classes. He, he called for righteous relationships. The words of the apostles and the epistles are consistent with that. Paul and others benefit from the benevolence of the wealthy, you know, certain wealthy individuals like in Luke 23, 50 and Acts 17, 12 that supported Paul and, and you know, his ministry, uh, you know, Paul benefits from business owners in Acts sixteen fourteen. He never links their conversion or walk with God to the surrender of their business or the surrender of their possessions. The very idea of giving to the poor according to one's ability requires differing financial statuses. I mean, these are the kinds of things you read throughout the New Testament. There's no, so, there's no sort of utopian call or theological call for a classless society. The kingdom of God is not concerned with those sorts of things. It's concerned, though, with righteousness in whatever social class, whatever society that there happens to be uh, on earth. Again, principles like righteousness and telling people the truth, telling people the truth of the gospel, uh, all of these overarching concerns of the kingdom of God are applicable to any human society, uh, no matter what it is, and you know we can we can look at that and say, well, you know, if that were the case, then certain human societies, again, like communism, will say because of the coercive element there, and the you know the, the sort of the, the the prohibition of anyone getting you know well past a subsistence lifestyle, if if that were the case, those systems would have to change. Well, maybe that's the case. And you can make the same argument, you know, with sort of extortive or crony capitalism too. And again, crony capitalism is not what I would call sort of normal capitalism. I think we know what crony capitalism is, again, using economic status to wield political power and to get political preference. Again, that's the sort of thing that scripture would, would look down upon uh, from the get-go because it not only is inequity, it creates inequity and it creates – uh, a system where people become victimized. And you know, again, those are the sorts of ideas that the kingdom of God is concerned with because they transcend sort of the normal day-to-day -day monetary exchange sort of thing uh, that we would be talking about with economic systems. So I think it's pretty obvious that using Acts 2, 42 through 47 to prop up a political system is a dramatic overreading of the passage. Instead of political theory... We ought to be looking at Acts 2 for what it does tell us to do. And I have some thoughts there, too. I'll list four of them. First, believers ought to take care of believers. Now, that isn't a denial that charity extends beyond the believing community, only that Acts 2 shows us where having, things all, having all things in common starts. And that's uh, within the church. And if I could put it this way, wouldn't it be nice if church was not a time and place? Wouldn't it be nice if church meant the believing community no matter where you are and where it is? Um, you know, if, if we thought really more on the non-local level, 
when it comes to this. Uh, I, I think there would be some significant points of application that would really uh, make the church socially and culturally distinct uh, from what it is now. But in, in our culture, unfortunately, church has become a time and a place, and that's pretty much it. And it becomes insular. It's not something that uh, reaches out. And even within the community, again, if you're thinking church is, is a time and a place, you tend to lose sight of why you're really there. And one of the reasons why you're really there is to take care of fellow believers. Second, I would say it's poor theology to presume that the state should be taking care of people in our churches. Now, we might like like to hear socialism and communism aren't biblical, but neither is letting the government do what the church is supposed to be doing. And granted, we live in different times with complicated circumstances like, you know, the dissolution of the family and there's significant geographical separation of family members. So you can't always presume that the extended family is going to be there to meet the needs of its members. Uh, You know, we all understand that. But in my experience, Christians often feel suspicious or reluctant. They, they feel those kinds of things, suspicion or reluctance, more than sort of this bond of love or this bond of affinity, this bond of community when it comes to believers in need, even within you know, the, the walls of, of a particular church. Again, that, that just shouldn't be. Uh, I, I don't see how you can uh, think that way and read Acts 2, 42 through 47, and sort of be honest with yourself. Third, the picture in Acts is also one where believers were aware of the needs of others, and there was no shame in the situation. Now, again, I'll grant that the situation was different. We have a fledgling faith going up against immediate persecution. That has a way of bonding people, again, a circumstance of persecution. But I would suggest that shouldn't it be easier to help out when you're not being persecuted? Again, just something to think about. And lastly, I can't help seeing something of an Edenic model uh, in, you know, sort of behind Acts 2, 42 through 47. Now, I don't know that, that there was any deliberate intent there, but I look at that passage and I just, I just can't help thinking of what an Edenic circumstance might have developed into. And what I mean by this is that the church ought to be a bit like Eden, where believers are family. I mean, for real, they really are family. And no one is in want for, for genuine needs. I mean, I'm not talking luxuries and, and things like that, but, but things that in our culture we really need uh, to, you know, to make ends meet. And it, we all know what Paul wrote in Second Thessalonians, if you, if you don't work, you shouldn't eat and all that sort of thing. And, and that's certainly biblical theology. But there are circumstances in life, and we're all well aware of this, where sometimes you know, someone can't work or can't find work, or they, they run into some other circumstance that sort of, you know, throws a monkey wrench into that model that Paul, you know, very, very clearly articulated to the Thessalonians. You know, when you get in these situations, believers are family, and no one should be in want of a genuine need. It, it's really, you know, what's really needed should be taken care of, again, within the community. And it, I'll admit this is a bit, this is a bit, uh, I don't know if, if personal is the right word, but I can remember in my own life just wondering, you know, seeing people. This was as a teenager. I was a new believer. And, uh, you know, just knowing that there are people in the church and outside who were coming to the church that just really had significant needs. And, you know, maybe they didn't mention it. And so that's part of the problem. But even if it was really transparent that this person really needs help with groceries this week or this month or for an extended period or, or rent or something like that, or has a bill that if this was just removed, then, you know, that would just create a certain, you know, window of financial freedom for this person. Uh, I, I remember just thinking, why in the world are we spending so much money on things like flowers that sit in front of the pulpit? I mean, I, that was sort of how my, you know, admittedly somewhat, you know, adolescent juvenile mind was thinking, you know, like, why do we care about these sorts of things when there are these legitimate needs right in front of our face? And I actually asked uh, one time, I I asked, you know, the the pastor of the church about that. And and his answer was, well, you know, if we don't have nice things like this, if the building isn't attractive, people, you know, certain people won't want to come. And again, my, my, I guess, naive response to that was, let them stay away. Don't you know? Who cares if they come? I mean, if if this is if this is all the deeper their faith is, then let them go somewhere else. And again, it just that obviously didn't go anywhere. 
uh, at the time, but I meant it then and I still mean it now. You know, I've, I'm, I'm quite unrepentant for thinking those sorts of thoughts, you know, because if, if that's really why you're there, if that's what you need to keep you coming back, you know, you've got significant spiritual problems. And, you know, you ought to be thinking about that rather than, you know, hey, the flowers look nice this week. And again, the, the person sitting next to you in the pew, you know, is in some serious need of some resource. And I think it goes beyond money resources too. We have lots of people in church that could train people to do a job or give people a suit to go for a job interview. There's there's just any number of things we could do to have more of all things in common and really in some small way mimic legitimately what we see going on in Acts 2, 42 through 47. It's not there to erect a state or to make a church state or a state church or endorse any political system. It's there to be a model of how believers should be thinking about their own community. The greatest example for me personally, as far as community, was the Native Americans. I really, minus the violence, if you take that element out, I really liked their lifestyle. They were a family. They stayed together. They had each uh, had a different position, job, responsibility. They, They knew everybody, and I really liked that particular sense of community throughout history. You know, you know what I think of, and I, I don't know much about Mormons, okay? So, so I could have a, this could be a complete caricature, uh, an incorrect caricature, but the whole notion of like storing up food and other resources so that if there is some sort of, you know, tragedy or some sort of rough circumstance for a while, I mean, they are ready to take care of their own. I mean, just no questions asked. It, it, you could flip the switch tomorrow, and they are fully capable of meeting the needs of the people within their congregation, and probably even beyond that, uh, on a, on a local level. And it's like, boy, you know that that's just really good forward thinking. If if you, if we never have a rough time, you know, maybe a natural disaster or some other you know sort of event then they could still use that, you know, in a food shelter or something like that or, or on a week-to-week basis if there's a family that, that needs something. I mean, that, that's just good thinking uh, in, in my view. So I, I wish, again, we would see resources devoted like that, uh, again, kind of forward thinking but also, you know, thinking of practical ways to help, you know, people that, you know, want to – and they are. Again, they have they – have, a testimony of being, you know, in the, in the family of God, you know, people that come to to our churches and, and do that. And, and even people outside the building. I mean, if, you know, would it really be a bad thing if you become known as the church that helps people, you know, how, how does that hurt? And I think I realize it can be abused and you have to have some wisdom there. I mean, in, in our church, you know, we, we have these kind of conversations a lot. So I, I know there's, there are things to be wise about here, but the, most of the momentum seems to swing back the other way, and, and churches don't have anything like that. And I th- just think it's really unwise. Yeah, I think nothing short of a catastrophe globally will it bring everything, society, back to a local community. I mean, now we live in a society where we don't even know our neighbors. I find that sad. And I really liked your first point, uh, the concept of church being everywhere, wherever you are. You know, it's not just a physical building and 10 o'clock on Sunday morning or Wednesday nights or whatever. It's, it's every day, every time, every person. Yeah, it's like when you hear the word church, I mean, we're, we're just trained culturally and I think in our churches, ecclesiastically, if I can use that term. We're, we're trained when we hear the word church to think of that place at that time or some other you know, s- specific time where an activity or a program is running. You know, what, what if when we heard the word church, we could see like 50 or 100 faces of people that we knew were believers? I, I, I just think that would be life-changing and church-changing <laughs> uh, if we thought of it differently. I agree. Uh, that's what I tell people when it's 12 o'clock and Dallas Cowboys are playing. And it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we have the Seahawk problem, you know, where, where I live. Okay. So I get, I get that. Do you have any other last thoughts? No, no. I think that's that's what I wanted to, to sort of spout off on today. Okay. Well, next week we're going to have our first Q&A episode. So please send in any questions to me or Mike uh, in the subject line. If you wouldn't mind putting the episode that your question is relating to. Mike, do you have any other no, well, well, today, today I'm actually taking off in a couple hours for Portland. We have a regional uh, 
meeting of the Evangelical Theological Society on Saturday. So I'm going up there, my son's going along, but I'm, I'm going to meet uh, somebody there who follows the podcast and the blog, you know, the Naked Bible blog. So, you know, I kind of like when, when those sorts of things are, are possible, you know, and I'll, I'll post something about, you know, I'm going here or there. And I'll get emails and say, hey, you know, if I come over, can we chat, you know, get you a cup of coffee, even though I don't drink coffee? I say, sure, you know, I, I actually like, you know, to meet people who you know, follow what I do because they, if, if they're that invested, they usually either have a good idea about something that they'd like to see, or they'll, they'll say something about, Hey, you know, I really appreciate this. And, and then I'll, I'll get to ask questions. Well, what about that? And it, you know, I, it's a good way to get feedback in, in sort of a direct way, you know, about, uh, what I'm doing and, and sort of, you know, they, they, people usually want to pick my brain about something, but I, I kind of like to pick back a little bit. And I may not always tell them, you know, that that's what I'm doing. But it, it's a good way to get some sort of direct feedback on what's helpful and maybe doing something different to make something more helpful or something you know, that's altogether you know new and and having a good idea to think about and sort of put in the hopper and and you know maybe that'll become a reality maybe it won't but it just helps me to think about stuff I should be doing speaking of helpful our transcripts I just want to remind everybody that our transcripts usually go on our website 4 to 5 days after the show airs so a lot of people have been asking me where can they get the transcripts? Well, you're going to find those transcripts. The link is actually on the episodes page. So if you click, I think we've got 35, 36, 37, 38 episode transcripts up. So if you click the link to go into that episode, you'll see the description of what the episode is about. And right below that, you're going to see the link for the transcripts. And they're in PDF mm-hmm. format. And I just want to make sure everybody knows where they can go get those transcripts. And, and to be patient, they usually will get on the website about four to five days in that time frame. So we'll mm-hmm. get them up there as soon as we get them. Yeah, yeah. I, everything I've, you know, people have chimed in about those, they're very appreciative. Absolutely. And thank you, Mr. Tudor. Yep. Yep. Mr. Tudor gets another, another, <laughs> another thank you. Okay. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to another episode of the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.